from the heart lessons and truth. We are going to uh, continue on in our study in Matthew, but I, I really felt that uh, the Father wanted me to talk more about repentance, and this is the season of repentance. And it's very important that this is a time that we're searching our hearts. So we're going to look at the month of Elul and talk about uh, what it is, what this season is about. And I believe there's a special anointing uh, during this season for repentance. Again, we see in, um, well, let's pray first. So, Venom King, our Father, King, Father, I thank you that you anoint my mouth. Father, give everyone ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive from your word this day, Father. Thank you for your anointing and Rach HaKodesh that you would say what needs to be said during this program in all boldness and love in Yeshua's name. Amen. So we're going to look again at Matthew chapter 3, and this is a Tree of Life version uh, translation. In those days, John the Immerser came, proclaiming in the wilderness of Judea, Turn away from your sins, for the kingdom of heaven is near. For he is the one Isaiah the prophet spoke about, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of Adonai, and make his path straight. So again, this is a season, again, where we are uh, looking at our hearts and turning away from sins that... Uh, so easily beset us, cause us to trip up. I just want to read a little bit from uh, our devotional, 40 Days of Teshuva. Elul is the sixth month of the biblical calendar year. This month is set aside for Teshuva repentance in anticipation of the fall feast. The month of Elul is a time to prepare for Yamin no Arim, the ten days of awe, getting our spiritual house in order. This is the time to look into our hearts and ask the Ruach HaKodesh to search our hearts and reveal any hidden sins, resentments, unforgiveness, pride, anger, bitterness, etc. And to repent, make teshuva, and work at walking according to the spirit, not the flesh. The month of Elul is traditionally a time of repentance for 30 days that leads up to Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets and the 10 days of Ah up to Yom Kippur. So we're going to look again a little bit what this month of Elul is all about and I'm going to look at uh, a list of things that we may need to search our heart for and repent of so we can be restored back into uh, our, so there's no hindrance with our relationship with the Father. You know, He loves us but sin separates us from Him. It, uh, it affects the anointing, it affects answers to prayer, it affects our relationships. So we're going to look at some scriptures and I'm just believing that the Ruach is just going to lead me to say what he wants me to say in Yeshua's name. So again, uh, the month of Elul is a time of repentance and preparation for the High Holy Days, which is Yom Kippur. I love this time of year. It's, you know, and it's... It's no coincidence that it's hap it happens during the fall when things are changing. You know, the, the colors of the trees change and they're starting to prepare themselves for, for winter to preserve themselves and, and the leaves start falling and, and the weather starts changing. And you can even sense a change in, even in the spirit realm uh, of a, a sense of teshuva, a sense of change that... Again, I believe there's an anointing during this time of the year that God uh, has placed. And I think, that, you know, this is especially a time to be praying and interceding for those that don't know Yeshua as well. Again, tradition teaches that the month of Elul is particularly propitious time for repentance. This mood of repentance builds throughout the month of Elul to the period of Selachot, which is a, a series of prayers that are said to Rosh Hashanah and finally to Yom Kippur. Again, it's about searching our own hearts, not somebody else's heart. You know, there's a saying, when you point the finger at somebody, you got three pointing right back at you. So we need to, again, point the fingers at our own heart, make our own heart right, so we can walk in the fruits of the Spirit and be lights in, in this dark world. And there's, you know, there's so much going on in, in the world today, so much tragedy. We see these uh, the hurricane that just hit Houston, another one that's, that's uh, going to hit uh, Florida by the time this aired. You know, we're, we're praying that it'll, that it'll miss it and go back out to the sea. 
um, earthquakes, fires in different states, and I believe God is giving us a wake-up call um, <clears throat> that we need to, you know, to turn our hearts around. And I want to read uh, Matthew 24 because uh, this is Yeshua. You know, they asked him, "What are the signs of your return?" I'm going to begin with um, <clears throat> verse. Th uh, let's see, verse. Look at verse 29 because this is a long chapter. We'll get it in more details later, but I'm going to begin with verse 29. But immediately after the trouble of those days, the sun will darken and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven, then all the tribes of the land will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a great shofar, and they will gather together his chosen from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch becomes tender and puts forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Amen. I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. <clears throat> Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But of the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, except the Father alone. For just as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and swept them away. So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be left in the field, one taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and one left. Therefore stay alert, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Hallelujah. And those of us of believers, every day we look for his return. Every day we uh, watch in expectancy. But again, no man knows except the Father. But he says there will be signs. There will be things happening. Uh, be prior to this verse, he says there will be wars and rumors of wars and, you know, and false messiahs and, and signs and, and wonders. But, you know, he said that, you know, to... Uh, there is going to be a great tribulation, you know, coming upon the earth. And again, there's there's so many things going, but we need to be prepared for his for his return. And this is a time where we search our hearts to see if we are truly repair, um, prepared or if we've fallen asleep. Um, again, the name in Aramaic, um, the word alone means search which is appropriate because this is a time of year when we search our hearts. According to tradition, the month of Elul is the time that Moses spent on Mount Sinai preparing the second of the tablets. Again, he spent 40 days on Mount Sinai receiving the word of God. It was during that time while he was up there that Israel sinned and built the golden calf. So he is, according to tradition, he ascended on Rosh Kadesh Elul and descended on the 10th of Tishri at the end of Yom Kippur when repentance was complete. Other sources say that Elul is the beginning of a period of 40 days that Moses prayed for God to forgive the people after the golden calf incident, after which the commandment to prepare the second set of tablets was given. So, as well, we need to be interceding and praying this time for a lost and dying world, for uh, the people to come back, uh, his children who have maybe gone astray, our lost loved ones, praying that they would come back to him and receive salvation. During the month of Elul, from the second day of Elul to the 20th day, the shofar, and here I have a, this is one of our shofars here, this is what a, a shofar looks like, is blown after morning services every weekday. 
Uh, the shofar is now blown on Shabbat. It is also now blown on the day before Rosh Hashanah to make a clear distinction between the rabbinical rule of blowing the shofar on Elul and the biblical mitzvah to blow the shofar, shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And there's four blasts, different blasts, a takiyah, shofarim, teruah, and takiyah. Again, the blowing of the shofar is a wake-up call to call sleepers to be aroused from our complacency, a call to repentance. The blast of the shofar is a very piercing sound when done properly. We're going to look at, <clears throat> also if we have time, if not maybe next week, on uh, reasons for blowing the shofar. Elul is also a time to begin the process of asking forgiveness for wrongs done to other people. <clears throat> According to Jewish tradition, God cannot forgive us for sins committed against another person until we have first obtained forgiveness from the person we have wronged. So this is a time that if you know that you have wronged somebody, you go to them and you ask forgiveness. It doesn't matter if they forgive you or not, but you're asking forgiveness. And hopefully they'll be humble enough to forgive you as well. And again, we need to make things right with others. <clears throat> and it also, you know, uh, Yeshua mentions that in Mark chapter 11, verse uh, 25. He says, uh, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your transgressions. So again, this is a process of seeking forgiveness and it continues through the day of awe. Uh, many people visit cemeteries at this time because of the awe-inspiring nature of this time makes us think about life and death and our mortality. You know, it's also a reminder, too, of that, you know, the, de the grave is not final for those who believe in Messiah, who have their hope in God, because uh, the Bible promises a resurrection for believers for eternal life, but there's also going to be another resurrection for those who have rejected God for eternal death, a time separated from God for all eternity. Um, as the month of Elul draws to a close, the mood of repentance becomes more urgent. Prayers for forgiveness called selachot, uh, often uh, pronounced slachus, are added to the daily cycle of religious services. The selachot are, are recited in the morning after normal daily shacharit service, and then they add another 45 minutes to the regular service. Uh, so people who are near a synagogue will go to the synagogue and have these services, but you can also do it at home as well. Uh, the Selachot prayers are recited from the Sunday before Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. If Rosh Hashanah begins on a Monday or Tuesday, Selachot begins on the Sunday of the week before Rosh Hashanah to make sure that there are at least three days of Selachot. The first Selachot service of the holiday season is usually a large community service held around midnight at Motzei Shabbat, the day after the Sabbath ends, that is after nightfall on Saturday. The entire community, including men, women, and older children, attend the service, and the rabbi gives a sermon. The remaining Selachot service are normally only attended by those who ordinarily attend daily Shachrit services in the synagogue. Now these are the traditional Elul services. And if you belong to a Messianic congregation, they may do this, or a regular synagogue as well. A fundamental part of the Selachot service is the rep repeated recitation of the 13 attributes a list of God's 13 attributes of mercy that are revealed to Moses after the sin of the golden calf. And here we see, uh, <clears throat> let's look at that, uh, Exodus 34, 6-7. to 7. Exodus 34, 6-7. to 7. Then Adonai passed before him and proclaimed, Adonai, Adonai, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth, showing mercy to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, 
yet by no means leaving guilty, the guilty unpunished, but bringing the iniquity of the father upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Then Moses quickly bowed his head down to the earth and worshipped. Hallelujah. So here we see the 13 attributes. Hashem, number one, Hashem. Two, God, which is, uh, again, Adonai, Adonai is repeated two times. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, ab abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and who cleanses. Why is Hashem listed twice as an attribute? And why are three of these attributes the names of God? Different names of God uh, connote different characteristics of God. The four-letter name of God, yud heh vav -Hey, but when many Jewish people refer to it as Hashem, is a name used when God is exhibiting characteristics of mercy, and the Talmud explains that this dual usage indicates that God is merciful before a person sins, but is also merciful after a person sins. The third attribute is a different name of God that is used when God acts in his capacity as the almighty ruler of nature and the universe. Now a scripture that just came to my mind is uh, 1 John. Get to that in a second here. First, uh, okay, first John. Uh, let's see. First John chapter uh, two. My children, I am writing these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an intercessor with the Father, the righteous Messiah, Yeshua. He is the atonement for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Now we know that we have come to know him by this, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God is made perfect, and we know that we are in him by this, whoever claims to abide in him must walk as he walked. Uh, also, um, you know, the word says that, that if we confess our sins, he is uh, faithful and merciful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, let's see, let's look at... 1 John chapter 1, uh, we'll begin with verse 5. Now this is a message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and keep walking in darkness, we are lying and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son Yeshua purifies us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So this time is, too, about the kingdom and the king. Acknowledging the kingdom and the king demands a response, and the response is repent, or the Hebrew shuv or teshuva, to turn around, quit sinning, and start doing good. Now, we just read that in 1 John. The Hebrew sense of repentance is very active. You stop going in the direction you are going. You turn around and return back to God's covenant standards, his commandments, his Torah teaching, and instructions as well as what Yeshua taught. Uh, 1 John 3, 4. Okay, let's go back there. 1 John 3, 4. Okay, 1 John 3, 4. Everyone practicing sin also practices lawlessness. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. Sin is, when it talks about lawlessness, it's talking about transgression of Torah, 
Torah means God's teachings and instructions. <clears throat> so sin is a refusal to do what God said we should do. I'm sorry, I'm going to need something to drink. True return of repentance is a return to Torah, God's teachings and instructions, which we believe, again, the Torah is the first five books of Moses, but it's also the entire Bible. The entire Bible is his teachings and instructions. In the Talmud, the sages make a connection between repentance and immersion in the mikvah. We talked about the mikvah um, a few weeks ago. This is what Yohanan was doing. He was preaching repentance, symbolized by, by immersion or mikvah in the waters. Sin and repentance. Tanakh 16a commentary uh, by Ben Ahava said, When one has sinned and confesses his sin, but does not repent, to what can he be compared? He can be compared to a man holding a dead reptile, something unclean in his hand, for although he may immerse himself in all the waters of the world, his immersion is of no avail to him. Why? Because it doesn't do any good to immerse yourself if you haven't repented. All you're doing is getting wet. But if he would throw away the lizard, or that what is which unclean, which referring to sin from his hand, then as soon as he immerses himself, his immersion becomes effective, as it is said, but who confesseth and forsaketh, then shall he obtain mercy. So what is he saying? If you are holding a dead lizard, it makes you ritually unclean and impure, so the mikvah is useless because you are still unclean. Get rid of the lizard, then go into the water. That is what true repentance is. Get rid of what is unclean in your life. Consider this as we prepare ourselves to take up the yoke of the kingdom, is to acknowledge the king, Yeshua, as we prepare ourselves to be Talmudim, which is Hebrew for disciples. What a high calling. But first there has to become repentance. Again, one of the commands Yeshua said was to preach the gospel, the basura, the good news, and make disciples. We are to be disciples of Yeshua. Our first priority and our first task at hand is to repent, quit sinning, turn around, and start doing good. Come back to Torah because of the kingdom of heaven is now. It is our job to make a difference in this world as his Talmudim disciples by bringing Yeshua and Torah to the nations. And I just want to look at um, a list of possible, uh, this is a list we hand out to our congregation, because sometimes, you know, <clears throat> we, we don't realize, you know, that some sins aren't as obvious as others. So here's a list, and hopefully, let's see, you can, you can see it. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Okay. So here is, again, a, a list of things that we, kind of like a checklist, you know, if, if, if you know that these are things in your life that you need to repent of, then put a check mark by it so that when you come before the Father, you can bring the list before Him and say, Father, I truly repent of these things in my life. I don't want them in my life anymore. Thank you for cleansing me from these sins in Yeshua's name. So let's read through them. First is rejecting Yahweh's Torah. Not preparing spiritually or physically for Shabbat. In other words, taking Shabbat lightly. Not paying attention to the word coming forth from leadership, i.e. letting your mind wander, sleeping, talking, looking at your cell phone. Uh, disrespecting the anointing and presence of Yahweh. What are some other things we need to um, repent of? Self-bitterness self-rejection, self-hatred, becoming offended and not making peace with who the, those that you've offended, lack of trust in Yahweh's word, Lashon Hara, which is evil speaking against Yahweh and his people, believers, uh, disobedience, anger, fear, bitterness, Cares or anxiety. Well, why cares and anxiety? Because it is fear and it's a lack of trust in God. Jealousy, rage, resentment, stinginess, stress. Again, stress 
is fear. It's a lack of trust in God. Unbelief. Sexual sin, pornography, sex outside of marriage, etc. Habitual sin, sins that you keep on repeating. Uh, disobedience to Torah, unfaithfulness, robbing God of tithes and offerings, generational curses. These are things that can be passed down from generation to generation for those who uh, have not served God. And, and you know, that's, uh, we'll do a teaching on that down the road. Uh, pride, that's a big one. Rejection, um, lack of daily worship and prayer, unforgiveness. Love of Yahweh has grown cold, backsliding, lack of faith in God, dishonesty, or lying, not being transparent, drug addiction, alcoholism, bad eating habits, giving up and not fighting the fight of faith, murmuring and complaining, not taking responsibility for our sins, not confessing our sins not fasting, Involve, involvement with the occult, including Kabbalah, unloving, racial prejudice, abortion, covenant breaking, i.e. not obeying the word, physical and uh, verbal abuse of spouse, children, and yes, even pets, uh, conforming ourselves to the world instead of the word, his Torah, not using the gifts that Yahweh has put within us to bless others, rejecting the call of God. So we need to ask our, you know, go through this list and we need to be honest with ourselves and ask the Father to, to help us to, uh, to change us. Because He can, if, if you are struggling, He is there to help you and to deliver. You don't have to live with this garbage in your life. You make the choice to hang on to it. You don't have to hang on to it. Let go of that lizard. Let go of that uncleanness and receive his cleansing and his righteousness and be free in Yeshua because he already paid the price for your freedom. Let's get back to the teaching here. Okay, we see that uh, the Word has a lot to say about repentance, and we covered this before, but I want to uh, read some other scriptures here, also in the time that we have left, that we could pray for ourselves. And if you want this, uh, this list of scriptures and this other list of repentance uh, I can, and um, some of the prayers uh, for this season, you can just email me at dmmbmth at comcast.net and I will email these to you. Just say you want um, the information on Teshuvah and Repentance and I will email that to you and I'll show you at the end the email address as well. Again we see in these scriptures that re repent means to cease performing actions contrary to Torah and to begin living in accordance with the Torah. And we've covered these scriptures before, uh, but again, repent and believe. What does that mean? Again, it's, you know, the message of the Bible is repentance and belief in God and what he says. It means living, trusting, faithfulness, living in trustful faithfulness to Yahweh. The gospel or Betzor or good news was a sacred message that if the children of Israel would live whole heartedly by the complete covenant of God as revealed through Moshe, then Yahweh would prosper their lives in the land of promise. And we see in these scriptures of well that Yeshua preached and the disciples preached repentance. And we see that repentance leads to life. And I just want to read uh, some scriptures here. for maybe some areas that we need to uh, deal with in our life. Uh, we need to ask the Father, or Yudhevave, to break through our complacency and pride. Isaiah 29, 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as his people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. 
Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Matthew 11:29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. When you repent, you find rest, you find peace, you find shalom, because that burden's been lifted. We have to ask the Father to deliver us from the power of sin. Psalm 131, Out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Yahweh. Yahweh, hear my voice, let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Yahweh, shouldest mark iniquities, O Yahweh, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for Yahweh, my soul does wait, in his word do I hope. My soul waits for Yahweh more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in Yahweh, for with Yahweh there is mercy, and with him plenteous redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Matthew 9, 12, and 13, But when Yeshua heard that, he said unto them, that they who are whole need not a physician, but they who are sick. But go and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I will come to call the right. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And he was being criticized because he would be eating and fellowshipping with sinners, but the reason why he was doing that was to bring them to repentance. And those are, he says, he goes, those that are sick don't need a, uh, are healthy, don't need a physician, but those that are sick. And Yeshua went to, came to heal the sick spiritually and physically. Uh, we read in, uh, well, Psalm 51, we, we cry, we ask God to purify our hearts. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Sin robs us of joy. If you've lost your joy, then you need to look at your heart and find out, why have I lost this joy? Have I put my eyes on something other than God? Or I'm trusting something other than than God to give me joy. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. When we repent, we are drawing nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When you resist him, he has no authority over you. Verse 9, be afflicted and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So again, uh, mourning is, a, is, a, is to repent. You're, you're sorry, you're grieved for your sins, but when you truly repent, that joy will be restored again within your heart. During this time, we need to ask the Father to renew our hearts to obey Him. Ezekiel 36, 26, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. As our heart become hardened towards God, you know, every time we ignore God's word every time we disobey, every time we act in opposite of the word, our heart gets hardened. And we need to repent so that God will give us once again a heart of flesh, a tender heart towards God. And when we do that, he forgives us. When, again, this is a time of cleansing and restoration. Why? Because God wants us to draw near to him so he can, we, he can draw near to us through Yeshua. Mark 12, 30 and 31, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and with all the, your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than this. So when we're walking, again, when we're loving God with 100% of our being, 
and we're loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. A lot of times we have problems loving other people because we don't love ourselves. And again, that's a sin. We need to see our we need to know how much that God loves us. And when we know how much God loves us, it's easier to love others. It's easy, and when we love God with all that we have, again, we are fulfilling the Torah by doing that. Why? Because when you love God, you're going to walk in obedience to God. 1 John 3, 23 and 24, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwells in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us. Hallelujah. Well, let's go on here. Um, let's look at... Um, so again, what is a repentance that leads to life? We'll look at, let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 46. We'll look at some of these scriptures. Uh, we still have some time here. Thirty-two, forty-six, and forty-seven. <clears throat> he said to them, "Put in your hearts all the words that I call as witness against you today, <clears throat> that you may command your children to keep and do all the words of this Torah." For it is not an empty thing for you, because it is your life. By this word you will prolong your days on the land which you are crossing over to Jordan to possess. So when we walk in <clears throat> obedience, it prolongs our life. Uh, in Acts 17, look at Acts 17. Verses 29 and 30, 29 to 30. Since we are his offspring, we ought not to suppose a deity is like gold or silver or stone, an engraved image of human heart and imagination. Although God overlooked the period of ignorance, now he commands everyone everywhere, everywhere to repent. So, you know, before somebody gave you the word, maybe you did things out of ignorance. But now, once you hear the word, you don't, you're not walking in ignorance anymore. You have no excuse. And again, repentance brings life. Repentance towards God and faith in Yeshua. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17. So the dragon became enraged at the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. <clears throat> so who is the enemy enraged at? Those who are walking in obedience to the Torah of God and belief in Yeshua. 14.12 here is the perseverance of the Kedoshim, or saints, set apart ones, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. So again, when you're walking in obedience, you are keeping the Torah and your faith in Yeshua. Again, they go hand in hand, repentance uh, towards God and faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. And repentance is, again, is to walk in obedience to his Torah. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Therefore you are without excuse, O man, every one of you who is judging. For by whatever you judge another, you condemn yourselves. For you who judge practice the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who practice such things is based on truth. But you, O man, judging those practicing such things, yet doing the same, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you belittle the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance? So we're going to look at, uh, with the time we have left, ten reasons for blowing the shofar 
on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Turah, which is the day of the awakening blast. That's what it refers to. So 10 reasons for sounding the shofar. A 9th century Babylonian teacher, Sadia Gaon, taught that there were 10 reasons that the Holy One commanded us to blow the shofar on Yom Turah. Number one, just as earthly kings have horns and shofar blown to celebrate the anniversary of their coronation, so Hashem wants the shofar blown on the anniversary of the creation when there came to be a world that Hashem would rule over, as it is said in Psalm 98.6, with shofarot and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before Hashem, the king. Number two, just as earthly kings have horns and shofarot blown to announce their decrees, and only after this warning actually enforce the decree, so Hashem wants the shofar blown to announce the beginning of the ten days of return, when all are commanded to turn their lives around. Number three, just as the shofar blew when Hashem gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, so it blows to remind us each year to do as our forefathers said on Sinai in Exodus 24-7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people, and they responded, we will do everything Hashem has said, we will obey. Number four, just as Ezekiel compared the words of the prophets calling for the people to change their ways to a shofar, so we must know that those who hear the shofar and do not take warning and change their lives will be responsible for their own destruction. As it is said, Ben Adam, or son of man, speak to your countrymen and say to them, When I bring the sword against the land, and the people of the land choose one of their men, and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land, and blows the shofar to warn the people. Then if anyone hears the shofar, and he does, but he does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes his life, his blood will be on his own head. Since he heard the sound of the shofar, but did not take warning, his blood will be on his own head. If he had taken warning, he would have saved himself. But if the watchman sees a sword coming and does not blow the shofar to warn the people and the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, that man will be taken away because of his sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood. Ben Adam, or son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, a wicked man, you will surely die, and you did not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked men will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will save yourself. Number five, because the shofar was blown as a war alarm when the temple was destroyed, it should remind us of the destruction of the temple, the disaster that we brought upon ourselves, and thus should warn us to abandon our misdeeds, in order to avert disaster, as it says in Jeremiah 4, 19 and 20. O oh, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain, O oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me, I cannot keep silent. For I have heard the Torah of the shofar, I have heard the battle cry. Disaster follows disaster, the whole land lies in ruins, and in an instant my tents are destroyed and my shelter in a moment. Number six, because Hashem used a ram, ram's horn as a substitute sacrifice for Isaac. The ram's horn should remind us how Isaac and Avraham were prepared to give up all their hope and dreams for Hashem's sake. Genesis 22. Number seven, since the blowing of the shofar or horn causes cities to tremble, so the shofar will make us tremble and fear our Creator. As it says in Amos 3, 6, when a shofar sounds in a city, do not the people tremble. When disaster comes to a city, has not Hashem caused it? Number eight, since the shofar would be blown on the great day of Hashem. Zephaniah 1, 14 and 16, the day of Hashem is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of Hashem will be bitter, the shouting of the warrior there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, 
a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of shofar and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. Daniel speaks of this judgment day in Daniel 7, 9 to 14. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from behind him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. Daniel speaks of this judgment day, in, uh, seated, which is seated for judgment. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me, was one like a son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that all that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So we can see in this passage the coronation of the King of Kings, who is none other than Yeshua himself. Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6, I saw thrones in which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And as I saw the, soul, the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Yeshua, and because of the word of God, they had not worshipped the beast or his image, and not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. We see this happening in the Middle East today. Thousands upon thousands of Christians are being murdered by ISIS because they will not bow their knees to Islam. They will not deny Yeshua. And they are being beheaded. They are being burnt alive. They are suffering horribly. And these are the ones that, are, that, that the Revelation is talking about. When he, those that before them as well who, who would not deny Yeshua even in the face of death. They came to life and reigned with Messiah a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have, put, who have part in the first resurrection. The first resurrection is for believers. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Messiah and will reign for him with him for a thousand years. Number nine, since the shofar will be blown when the tempest tossed of Hashem's people are gathered in. Harmony to the land of Israel, we should, we should hear the shofar to stir our longings for that day. As it is said in Isaiah 27, 12 to 13, And that day Hashem will thrust from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt, and you, O Israelites, will be gathered up one by one. And in that day a shofar gadol will sound, those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship Hashem on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. This reminds us of Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud shofar call, and he will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heavens to the other. This reminds me, when I was a child, I was probably eight, eight years old, I, ha I had this exact vision I was. I saw. I found myself standing in my backyard, and the, it was the darkness was so dark you can cut it with a knife. It was. I mean, it was scary, and all. And the the night. The night was pitch black. I mean, again, the darkness upon earth. It it scared me. I can't even explain it. But then the the skies opened up, and there was Yeshua, just as uh, Revelation explained, with thousands upon thousands with them. And all I could think of was like, 
Am I ready to meet you? Even as a child, I knew that I had to be ready to meet him. How do you think people are going to feel who have rejected him and then when he appears and there is no hope because they've rejected him? Or those who have resurrected when they stand before him and they've rejected him, the second resurrection. He is coming again. He is returning to earth and his word is true. And the whole point of this program is to preach and teach his word to whoever will listen to what he has to say to your heart. Number 10 says, The shofar will be blown when Mashiach revives the dead. We hear the shofar in order to revive our faith in the supernatural transformation, the, fin the final victory of life and freedom over death, the ultimate oppressor. As it says in Isaiah 18.3, All you people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it, and when a shofar sounds, you will hear it. This reminds us of another Yom Teruah event, Ezekiel 37, 1-14. The hand of Hashem was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of Hashem and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Hashem, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of Hashem. This is what the Sovereign Hashem says to these bones. I will take breath, enter you, and you will come to life. And I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am Hashem. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Hashem says, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Hashem says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am Hashem when I open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land and that you will know that I, Hashem, have spoken and I have done it, declares Hashem. In 1948, the Jewish people returned to the land of Israel. And this was a miracle. I mean, this cut off the live replacement theology that the church has replaced Israel and God was no longer dealing with Israel. What a lie. Because here God promised that he would restore his people after the Shoah, the Holocaust, after, you know, Hitler and, you know, pogroms, you know, time and time again tried to destroy God's people. He brought them back to the land and now they are thriving in the land. The land is blooming. God is faithful and he is continually restoring the whole house of Israel. <clears throat> also in this passage we see the resurrection of the righteous, the whole house of Israel, and the ingathering of the exile back to Israel. The word translated breath in the Hebrew is ruach. Yom Teruah literally means a day for breathing and by implication a day for blowing. I believe that this is an intentional play on words in order to make room for both thoughts. So again, we see uh, that they were, we were seeing so much prophecy being fulfilled. The Jewish people returning to land. We are seeing believers in Messiah returning to a biblical lifestyle, keeping the feasts, keeping the Shabbats. We see this happening all over the world. God's Spirit is calling them back, <clears throat> calling them out of, of ways that are not biblical, out of celebrations that are not biblical returning to keeping the Shabbat, returning to keeping the feasts. He is, uh, again, if you are, Romans 11 says that if you are grafted into Messiah, you are grafted in to the house of Israel, in Messiah. 
which means you should be keeping the Torah. The Torah has not been done away with. The Torah has not been discontinued. It is his teachings and instructions. It is instructions for life, how to live a holy life in Messiah. In fact, the whole, as we're looking through uh, this study uh, on Messiah and the teachings of the, of the apostolic scriptures, they taught a Torah lifestyle in Messiah Yeshua. They did not teach contrary to Torah. They kept the feasts. They kept the Shabbat. They proclaimed and kept the Torah of Israel. Well, I'm running out of time. Uh, again, I want to just pull up where you can email me as well. At, um, the email address is up here. dmmbmth at comcast.net. I'll, I'll send you these notes. You can also go to our website at DeborahsMessianicMinistries.com. There's a lot of teaching, a lot of information on the website as well to help you grow in Messiah. We have books, articles, you know, again, it's, it's there to teach the Word, to help you grow in your knowledge of Messiah Yeshua. And we 